This is our five compartment Q collection in a, in a display that actually each cylinder rotates. There's 12 cylinders that rotate each in opposite directions, alternates. And the display case in the center of this showcase unit actually holds 24 cues that are stationary. In total, there's 176 cues on display in the case, and there are eight cues snapped to the back of the backboards on each compartment. There's two. It is lighted with lights that go from dim to bright and yellow to white. The lower section of the showcase has a ton of storage and in the middle is in effect what would have been a spool cabinet or an odds and ends cabinet and this came out of a pharmacy in New Hampshire and the, the original case was probably from around 1880. In this first section, the first compartment, most of the cues we have that are 1700s and 1800s, the earliest cues, are in the first couple of racks. The ones with the little cupped heads on them are called maces, and they are for pushing or slinging the ball. They were typically used by women. On the far left rack, several of the cues have the names of the manufacturer stamped into them. There's Brunswick and Emmanuel Brunswick and and Cavanaugh and Decker and and uh, Julius Balk and uh, even uh, Colander Q. Uh, on the right of the three um, racks is a couple of cues, a few cues made by the Wasco Billiard Company. That would be William A. Spinks. And uh, I would say the the age ranges from between uh, the late 1700s to the late 1800s in those first three racks in compartment number one. There's a glass door that slides over that. All of the cues are shown on the website with good close-up pictures of each one. This video is just to show you how the showcase functions. It's about 18 feet long and it's under 8 foot tall. Comes apart for easy shipping. The entire thing is oak. It's LED lighting so that it won't hurt the cues. Three more sections that have three racks each in them, and the center section that you'll soon see that is all marquetry cues, the inlaid pool cues, European, and uh, quite scarce. Took about a good 40 years to build this collection. Each cue has been refurbished as necessary to make it as close to what it was like when it was sold as possible. Moving left to right, this is obviously the second compartment, again with the glass door slid sideways. The four cues showing in the center rack right now are all cues from the Albert Pick Billiard Company. They were out of St. Joseph, Missouri. 
and they're from the late 1800s. The Albert Pink was known for the squares they used in the butts of the cues, wooden squares, and like little tic-tac-toe boards. Used with triangular shaped bone, ivory, and mother of pearl, most often mother of the pearl. Triangles in the bottom of the cues were there for inscribing the owner's initials on or their names or inscribing information explaining that the cue was won in a tournament for like first or second place prizes. All of the cues, a lot of the cues have those triangles, but only a few have signatures. The ones with initials are scarce, and the ones with signatures are even more scarce. The tournament championship cues are extremely scarce. The cues with the little stripes on them in rack number one, the world, the rack to the left, are made by the Fink Billiard Cue Company out of Germany. Three countries that made cues, the earliest cues, are usually, they were found in um, England, France, and Germany. The one with the crisscrossing inlay there, and the one with all the stripes going up and down is actually a three-piece cue. And then the one to the left of that, again with the zebra-style striping, those are all fake cues. The center compartment has been customized so that it'll hold either four shelves, four glass shelves that that go with the showcase and uh, we had a bunch of uh, collectibles displayed inside that showcase and then I designed this cue keeper set up for that thing and that holds 24 marquetry cues. These are mostly European cues, most of them were made in France or England, the majority of them were and uh, a lot of variety. They're all hand done and this uh, sort of cue was designed for the aristocracy, the dukes and the earls and the kings and queens, and uh, it's about a about a forty-year collection to there of those. Can't remember when I got the first one I ever found. Pretty exciting day, but there's twenty-four of them in there, all in great condition. Many of the earliest ones did not have tips and particularly didn't have ferrules. And these cues all, a lot of them have ferrules. And usually the ones with ferrules are from the 1850s on up to the, around 1900. And the ones without ferrules are cues that are pre-1850 and go clear back to the 1600s. Didn't start putting ferrules on cues until around 1830 or 40. The tips would show up before that. They figured out that leather made it easier to shoot without miscuing. So they were just gluing small pieces of leather onto the cues before ferrules. This fourth compartment is composed of cues from about 1870 to turn of the century. Most of them are 80s and 90s. And uh, they include a lot of the cues that started to show the butterfly splicing. 
the a lot a lot more elaborate splicing on the cues, and you started to see ferrules and tips on everything. You started to see the two-piece cues after the 1860s, particularly after the 1870s. Two-piece cues became quite the rage, and uh, putting your name in the triangle was also a pretty popular thing later in the 1800s. The uh, stickers showed up on the early Brunswick cues in the 1880s, 90s. They were the red sticker, or the uh, pardon me, the white sticker. And around the turn of the century to the early 1900s, you were seeing the red eagle sticker. Um, these cues uh, are made, like all the others, are made out of things like walnut and cherry and bird's eye maple and walnut and oak and ebony and rosewood, mahogany. Uh, there are probably about uh, 20 woods or so that they were made out of. And uh, now you're starting to see more cues that have the black shafts on the end which were put on the cues for people who wanted a heavier cue, but they wanted it to be balanced. So you had uh, any kind of a weight in the butt would make it pretty heavy, but it would be light on the nose. So they would change the front shaft to ebony to give the cue a better balance. You also started to see at this time, you were seeing your linen wraps at first, then later on in the 80s and 90s, you began to see cork wrapped cues and in the 1890s, leather showed up. So you got two thicknesses of linen, cork, and leather at that time, along with some carved handled cues. The two cues standing in the back of this case, in this compartment, are both, again, maces from the early 1800s. The two cues on the left tray uh, that you see with all the triangles work in them are French cues. The ones with triple splicing were called Model 36 if it was a one piece and a Model 360 if it were a two piece. And there are a few of those in there on the left spindle. The lighting gets much brighter in the showcase. We just turned it down here for the video we're trying to make. This fifth compartment is composed of a lot of the more expensive cues of the period. There are ones in here with the name plates, some signed. A few have ivory butt caps. There are models with linen wrap. There's one example. It'll show up on the left of the three racks, spindles. That's called an Eisenmeister cue. It's got a very unique wrap on it. Right dead center on the left rack is the Vulcanite cue. It's like what they made bowling balls out of. The next two, two to the left of that are what's called the fish pole cue. The next three on the left rack coming around front there are all what they call the fish pole cue. The two cues on the back wall are from the Albert Pick Company and they were used as salesman samples to display uh, the different sorts of options you had when you had a cue made. There's the Eisenmeister wrap in the front uh, left rack. Really funny tight knit on it. Very complicated. In the middle rack, the one in the center there with the white linen wrap breaks down into three pieces. That's called the hub cue from Brunswick. Those were 1890s into the early 1900s. 
Following that are a group of carved cues. The ones with the carved butts are much harder to find, very scarce. Several of these cues have the ebony shafts on them, which again was something that added to the cost of those cues. Several very rare models in this fifth and final compartment. On the third rack, there are a, a, another group of, of very fancy carved cues, and some of them had names in the catalogs. Uh, the one that's just disappearing on the right is called the Chinese Carved Butt, and now coming to the forefront is an ebony cue with an ivory joint and an ivory butt cap. Another one to the left of that that looks like bamboo is an ivory butt cap and a brass joint, and then that third cue is an actual bamboo fake cue. Fake to be bamboo. Hard to find. The two with the ivory heads and, and the one with the ivory joint and the brass joint, that pair of cues are what they call cane cues. You take them apart in the middle and you will slide the shaft up inside the butt and then replace the cap and tip and you have a cane. The first one there, the black one, the ebony one, is made by the Dorfelter Billiard Cube Company from Germany in the 1860s. Very early cue. The cane cues have been around a long time. They're nothing like the ones that you see today online for $50 and $60 that were made in the 40s. The next one is also uh, a faux bamboo style cue. Again, it has an ivory head on it, ivory butt cap. 